Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. It is on collaboration today, and we have with us Jeremy Brown. He was with us earlier talking about his publishing business, Throne Publishing. He's published over 400 books, and in that process has worked with a great deal of companies, help them grow and develop what it is that they're trying to do. And he's done some novel work with collaboration within his own business, and so I want to talk about that with you today, Jeremy. What got you started on that road? And let's start there, and then I'm just full of questions for you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lois, for letting me come back on. I really appreciate this opportunity, and I love this concept and the, the conversation that we're in today. So thank you for facilitating this and in creating these conversations. Um, I guess the whole thing started with I had a problem and I saw an opportunity. So the problem was... Like a lot of businesses, we were we were trying to find talent, and it takes a lot of time and resources to find, attract, retain, get to produce the right kind of people, and also be able to uh, our business. I wanted to keep it lean and mean to not have a ton of overhead, so I didn't want to really staff up and have be overstaffed, and I didn't want to be understaffed. So we started to 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 see that was a big problem in our business. At the same time, we saw an opportunity where uh, we saw the market for our business publishing books is just huge. It's big, it's evergreen, it's always going to be there. And so I truly just wanted to see more people go through our process. I didn't really care how they went through it or anything because I knew that there was a lot of transformation happening in people. And I know the market is basically not infinite, but the market is endless. If you're really helping people, you're really seeing them change, you're always going to have a market. It's always going to be getting bigger. And so I saw that opportunity for, there's a lot of people who need what we do. We do it very uniquely. They get results from it. So how can we see that happen as many times as possible in a way that doesn't make me have to hire a hundred writers? And so we just created a certification program where I basically said, I'm basically like selling you my business model and like a franchise, but it's not a franchise. And I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know to go and build a business like we did. And then, you know, we'll be able to refer people to you and all those kind of things, but you can fully go build a business on your own. And I honestly thought, Lois, it was going to be a great way to scale. I thought we might even transition out of publishing if we could get enough people doing it. And um, I love coaching entrepreneurs. What I never expected was people would still be able to, I give them everything. They could, they were fully equipped. They could fully build their own business, but they still wanted to stay working with us to some degree, which gave us access now. It was a way we ultimately monetized talent acquisition, but also created this whole community of people who are working together, working from them to us, us to them, and then they're working amongst themselves. And so it just became this really great network of talent. So you know what's interesting about that is, I, I don't know if you've seen some of the, the discussion on LinkedIn recently, but there was a company recently that downsized and um, invited 900 people to a Zoom call and in three minutes fired them all. And it, oh, yeah, I did, hear about this. did yep. you hear about that? And it got a response as you might anticipate. But I think that, it, that their experience is a real one. You're trying to meet your numbers and markets don't necessarily follow your growth plan the way you've outlined it. And so you're in this jagged ex experience of business. It's part of reality. However, people's lives are also impacted. And so their lives now suddenly become very jagged in response to the company. So in a sense, what you have done is you are staffing or at a certain percentage of capacity and using the rest of your resources, the people you've trained to for expansion when you need it. Am I hearing you correctly there? Yeah, and we've we've kind of always done that. I think so. We've always I've always wanted to hire management contract talent because when we have a book and we have an author, I want to be able to have a book is like a fingerprint. So I want to be able to really piece together the right team. But as we are scaling up, we do have a certain staff that can do a certain capacity. It's very small percentage of the total volume that we do. So I didn't want to have to continue to hire on. And I love working with entrepreneurs. 
I love helping people grow their business. I think there's a huge market for what we do. I'm not worried at all about people. You know, the biggest thing that people would say is like, you're going to cannibalize your own business because you're creating competition. And I really just didn't see it that way. I know that might be some naivety in me, but I think the market is absolutely huge. And what I never thought would have happened is this effect of now people actually want to continue working with us. So and tell me, did your business grow or shrink as a result? Huge. We doubled last year. You doubled so, as a result of that. And I didn't have to double my staff. I didn't have to scale. I didn't have to bring on a ton of expenses. Now, it did go up and we did have the growth expense that you would expect to see. But it wasn't like we we're I was stressed out. I was working 80 hours. I didn't work any more than I usually do. And, you know, when we were doing that other percentage of volume, you know, half of that. And now this year, we're going to probably do the same thing again. We'll probably do the same thing again in 2023. So and without you think you'll really, double this year or in, in the next in the coming year as well. Okay. Yes. That's now a lot we'll, of growth. And then we'll be right at a good plateau where it's going to require us to make some strategic decisions and really say, are we going to break some stuff? Or are we just going to steady out again to go through another phase of growth and really see? But um, yeah, we're having growth. It's a blast. We're able to handle it and we're able to maintain quality of our production, quality of the books. We're able to not burn people out. We're able to not get burnt out and everybody's winning. And I'm not, I'm not holding deals. I gave about a quarter of a million dollars in business away to that group. Now there's a lot of opportunity I'm leaving on the table for us, but I think that's part of what has to happen to collaborate well and keep people around is you just got to be willing to be generous, to be giving. And if I try to put controls around just being able to throw projects to people and let them figure it out, I don't think we would have grown as fast. I think I would have taken on projects or kept my hands on projects that would have slowed it down for the customer. And I just don't think it would have worked. So you create a process in order to make this happen. Tell us about that process. So that goes around the process of how we go from an idea to a book. And our authors actually speak their book out and we catch it and we put it into the written word for them, make a book out of it. But the core process is called the burn process. And I think to bring a community around something, you have to have some kind of shared language. There have to be something people all believe in and a process they all can follow to a certain degree, not to a T like a franchise, but they all have that kind of thing in common that they use in their own ways. So we created the burn process. Before I tell it to you real quick, though, I think what's important is I'm not so hardcore on it's got to be this way exactly. I know these people are entrepreneurial and they're going to take my core thing and some of them are going to totally copy it and do their own thing with it. Some people are literally going to take it and just put their name on it. It's going to happen. If it's good, people are going to copy it. If it's usable, people are going to use it. But also, some of them are going to take it and just add their own sizzle to it. And I was okay with all of that. You know, I don't want to see people steal our, our work, but you can't ever get ahead of the person you're stealing from anyways. So I just know being in publishing, it happens. And so I'm just letting it sit out there. Now, the burn process is this. If you, if you throw a bunch of materials into a fire, only the things of lasting value withstand the flames. You're going to have diamonds, gold, and steel. And so when somebody comes to us with their book and their idea, we throw it into this fire so that we can find the things of lasting value. Diamonds that display beauty through testimony, steel that gives strength, and gold that brings value. We find their very best, and it's a process we walk them through that produces and lets them find their very best content. That's the core process upon which everything else is built in our business. Okay, so that's a so you do a training around that. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty logical process, which is great. And I like how you have differentiated in with your burn process by burning, letting in the fire, only that which is going to be meaningful, important remain because we, we can throw an awful lot in that doesn't make add anything to a concept, a book, an idea. So I want to talk about that process. You teach it to them. Is it like a online teaching? Is it a one day course? Is it a certification program? What do you do? 
it is a certification program. So there's an online university that they walk through. They have to watch a certain amount of videos. And then there is weekly coaching calls that they can come on, get access to me and my team to ask any questions they have about building their business and implementing the process. So they get that up to a year. And so there's a lot of coaching that goes on because they can go learn it and that's fine. But really it's when they, the rubber meets the road, they start to apply it when they're going to have the questions. So we give them all that coaching and support that goes along with that. And that's really where we built a lot of the relationship. That's where I gave a lot, you know, we did two coaching calls a week. It's 104 a year approximately. And we did some quarterly training events that were one day or two day events as well. But that's really where we added a lot of value. I didn't really hold back from them. I exposed them to my network. I gave them everything that I could do. I gave them everything they needed to do to go do it totally on their own. And some of them did. And some of them did. They were successful. And they said, I would rather be part of a team. So now they're actually on our internal leadership staff now. You know, one of our our writers did that, our very best writer. We were able to bring in internally, which we're super happy about, super thrilled about. Because they said, I could run my own business, I could do it, but I'd rather master a craft and a skill. You guys figure out all the other stuff. Give me some people, let me write their stories. And that's what I want to do. So we've had it to where they were permanent, you know, long-term contractors, became employees, internal team members, and where we've had a few people who said, I'll take it and I'll run with it. And we kind of never heard from them again. And I'm good with all that. So do you have an application process? How do you choose or do you not choose? So right now it's me. I would interview every person individually and I would really just understand. I want to know if they're willing, if they have the heart for it, and if they have the skill set that they want to develop. If they're a culture fit like that, then we bring them into the program. But I started with, I just have a conversation with them. So that is the application. I have at least 30 minutes with them over the phone and that's what, that's the process. And then do you have a process of accountability that you build in with that as well? You know, we don't have a lot of accountability for them. Um, I didn't want to put all those controls around it. I didn't want to staff it. I didn't want to put it on them because I knew some of the talent weren't going to like that. And I think that was part of the, the magic that we saw here with this over the last two years that we plan on growing a lot next year is Wow. When, when we don't do those things, when I don't put all those controls around them, one, I'm not having to worry about people. I'm not having to manage it. I'm not having to deal with people who rebel against it. Because if you give them a bunch of rules, they're probably going to rebel. They're entrepreneurs. It's what they do. But it allows them to be free to do things, to try their own way, create their own inventions, with I, which I love to see. They figured something else out to go do. Or they just found ways to make it better or to develop their own process around it. But I didn't put any uh, controls around them or anything like that. But I do have, like, if I see somebody doing something that is just against our written convictions that we have, I'm going to have the conversation. If it's not course correct, do we do it? But it's not like I look over every piece of work or piece of material and I don't police them. But if somebody in in the community then started to self-regulate, You know, we had one or two times where some people brought to my attention, hey, this happened. I think you should look into this person. I did remedy the situation. But because I'm not that I'm talking about our convictions and what we really love and appreciate, they know that and they self do that because they want to preserve that community that they're getting value from. So now with the people that you have trained and are certified by you. Do they have a way of working together and collaborating amongst themselves as well? Absolutely. about that. So like, let's say one of them is a writer and the writer is writing a book. Now the other one might be a designer. The other one might be an editor. The other one might be a proofer and they all can work together on the same projects. They all know the same process. They all know the same convictions. So they are automatically have a built-in team for themselves too. So that way they didn't have to do a whole project all on their own. They could piece together the team. How that happens is when we do our trainings, they network. When they, we do our coachings, they meet. And we have a little Facebook group for them to connect and collaborate with. And we've had like magazines come in and offer them to write, all write articles and just creates a lot of opportunity for the people. And in 2022, we're going to be even more intentional about making the, some of those things happen for our group because we really started, Lois, by saying, I like to do this. Here's an idea. I don't need to have a lot of process to create results. So let me go create some results. Let's see what happens. And if it works, let's do it again. Build process around it. 
put people around it, the right people and drive it. So we've been in this for two years, this experimental phase, it's working. Now I'm like, we're going to put a person over the whole thing and we're just going to drive it and continue to refine it from here. You know, people talk about one of the advantages of collaboration is that there's a flow that you create. There's an energy flow. And but what deters you from that and letting the energy flow is the fear that people are going to compete with you. And I love what you say about you've just chosen not to worry about it because, you know, you're ahead of them anyway. Well, I'm ahead of the copiers, like somebody who just comes in and takes it and says, thank you. I'm going to rip these people off. Adios. Great. Saves me a ton of money and a ton of time anyways. I'm okay with, I'm totally fine with people on, in the program making it better than we could. I'm, I, I support it. I encourage it. To me, it's a logical thing of, I want what's best for them. And I think if you want what's best for the people around you, it makes life so much stinking better. It makes it so much easier. People like to be around you. I sincerely like to see them winning. I don't worry about them. I know some of them should become better than me. But I also know, like, I think if you're worried about competition, you just need to get better. Like, I know that, yeah, we give them a lot of stuff, but I know that a lot of other things I'm developing in my business, I'm teaching them to think the same way I do of like, how are you going to master what you're doing? you know, and everything like that. So I really don't worry about competition. I want to see them win. I want to see them succeed sincerely. And because I just feel that way, I think it keeps people around longer because they know I'm going to do right by them. Let me ask you the reverse side of this. When would this model not work? (sighs) When would it not work? Like, how would it not work? Well, how or why would it not work? I think if I was, if I and anybody on my team would be competitive with our own people, it's not going to work. If I put a lot of controls around it, it wouldn't work. If I made it into a franchise where I had to put all this legal stuff, financially, it wouldn't work. Um, it, I wouldn't even have interest in it. Um, I think that if we, if we weren't willing, like if I wasn't a Christian and really believed in the word and the Holy Spirit, I don't think it would work because I have to be willing to let people take my stuff. Uh, I have to be willing to let people try stuff and fail. And it really just to let people be free and use our stuff. So I think a, a Christian faith really lends itself to that and to be able to do it. Not like nobody else could, but I think that help, that's a big deal with it. Um that's a great question, Lois. I think if we didn't enjoy developing the people in it and seeing them succeed and celebrating that sincerely, it wouldn't work. See, I also hear from your description, it's it, it's really who you are that allows much of this to happen because you're not threatened by other people's success. Your ego it, comes from the joy of seeing them be successful, not the fear of them being um, competitive to you. And I think that's such an important distinction. Um, But it also means that you know yourself well enough to be able to hold those feelings in check and to be able to respond in in, in a really trustworthy, transparent, supportive way. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I do think it's, it is true that that's got to be one of the things, a way of being, you have to be in one of our convictions that we do have. And I, I just think that there'll be some things that will change with it as I build the process out. And now we see where Robert, like I left six figures on the table last year from it. And I saw that there and I knew it, it just didn't make my priority list compared to other ways we could maximize stuff. And so it might seem crazy to me to be like, you left the six figure opportunity on the table, but compared to other things that I just had the time bandwidth to do, it wasn't going to produce the ROI I wanted. And plus I wanted to see if I can hand stuff off to people, you know, part of this whole thing is being able to throw some, an opportunity somebody's way and see what they do with it and see how they handle it. And maybe they do great and we give them more. Maybe they don't do very great and we've got to do some damage control. And, but then I know, 
great. That actually, we won't, we won't go there again, or we'll be able to, are they corrective? Are they coachable? You know, all the things. So I think it, it just allowed me to do a lot of stuff, not being super controlling. Cause I am a control freak in a lot of ways, but not in this where I was like, let's just throw a bunch of opportunities at people. Let's see what happens in this whole thing. And I, I wasn't really married to it. My business didn't depend on it winning or losing, but now I see like all of our best talent, probably 80% of our best talent came from this group of people, which fascinates me. So tell me your business doubled. What happened to the people who are collaborating with you? The ones you have certified and are, are on their own. What's happened to their businesses? There are several people in this group that are now doing it full time, where before they came into the program going, I wish I could write stories for a living. And they are doing that right now. Some people who wanted to break into publishing, they're into publishing. Some people said, I've charged a couple thousand dollars, but I want to be up to the five figure range. They're doing that as well. So I have many people who their price ranges went from here to here because the value they can bring to the table is that much more. We had some people who had this much work and now they have this much work. And I have people where one of them now is on our internal staff. It's her career. Um, I have other folks where I'm, I make long-term deals with them of like, well, can you commit to doing 12 projects with me over the next 12 months? Yep, I can. Here's the cost. Done deal. Now they know they've got, that's the equivalent of, of, of more than a full-time income. You know, so there's a lot of winning happening. There are some people who came in, they went through the training, they got value, they didn't build a business, but I don't think that was a loss either because they walked away with a lot of lessons from us. They're applying what they learned in a different area. And that's all good too. I feel like we're, we help people form, we activate them, there's formation, and then they go and they get stuff done. Right. But I don't, we never had anybody ask for their money back. We never had anybody come to me saying, this is not what I thought. Um, and we, re I really did. I delivered me and my team. We delivered way more than we promised. Now that is not going to work long-term, but I wanted to make sure we're doing something new. Let's over deliver times 10 if we can to make absolutely sure people win because we're going to try a whole bunch of stuff to see what works and what doesn't. Okay. So now let's see, let's, let's imagine somebody's coming to us and wants to create a collaborative network or group that they can grow, will grow them exponentially just as it did you. What's your, your advice? Where do they begin? What would you say to them? Number one, what are the going to be the shared beliefs? And these beliefs should be, you should eat, sleep, and breathe them already. You don't have to create them. You just got to look at what matters to me right now and discern what those things are going to be. Okay. So we have six convictions and we say convictions or values are what's important. Convictions are what we sacrifice for anything I would ever do. This is the way I am. I'm that way at home. I'm that way at church. I'm that way in business. This is how things work. So there's shared beliefs or convictions. Number two, there's got to be a shared process that's proven. I think you have to have a proven process and you have to be able to have a mountain that says, by using this process, I climb that mountain. So if y'all want to climb this mountain, I can show you how to do that. There's got to be that process. There's got to be a big promise. This is what can happen in your life. If you are in this deal, if you follow this process, you're going to get these results. That's kind of how I, I would start off. I think that's a great question, Lois. So, so actually, it's that process and it, it and values, and I would agree with you. Um, values are so huge, aren't they? It's it's the cornerstone of a culture. I would say this too, like um, the first training we ever did, seven people showed up. I was pumped. I thought it was amazing. Seven people show up. We we just said we got to launch this thing. So I gave us four weeks launched it, seven people come. And um, cause it wasn't a small investment either. And so, but I was putting the curriculum together and I was like, you know what, we should probably share our convictions. I'll do that the, uh, the first night. It'll be the last thing I talk about. You know, I didn't think it'd be a big deal, but figure we should probably talk about it. The most talented person in the room who now is our internal team member at Throne says, that's why I'm working with you guys, those convictions. Oh, wow. And I thought, whoa. 
me and every, and I thought this, and this is the way good, all of our authors are this way. Their very best stuff is so natural to them. They think everybody does it and everybody doesn't do it. So when I share those convictions to me, it's like, this is what we do. This is how you be successful at anything. And so this is what, how we make decisions. This is what drives our decision-making in everything that we do. So like, if I'm not in the room, this is how you can make decisions. It's based on these. Share with the audience, what are those convictions that you have for your business? First thing is 1%. Every day we get 1% better. If you try to get 100% better all at once, it's overwhelming. But if you get 1% better every day for 100 days, you're 100% better. Number two, warrior spirit. Constantly seeking action-oriented solutions no matter what. We see ourselves as an offering to all of our customers. We bring everything we have to the table. Even if I'm only working for an hour, I'm bringing everything I got. Uh, Number three, it is joy-fueled. We say we are a force of joy-fueled people. We want to be joy-fueled. We don't want to be burnt out. Passionate people burn out more than anybody else because we're super passionate. So we want to be joy-fueled. Number three, truth. So we only publish experience-based content. Um, So somebody has to actually have lived it. Um, And if they haven't lived it, I don't want to necessarily publish it. That's my conviction. The uh, other thing is honor. So we want to say true things and we want to say them in a way that honors everybody involved. And if we can't do both of those things at the same time, we don't say it. Okay. And then the last one is purpose driven. We want to have a purpose bigger than ourselves. We want to honor each other. We want to honor God. We want to honor the earth. Everything that we do, we touch. Uh, uh, We want to honor that and be purpose driven. That is the higher purpose that we're about. Then it keeps our egos out of the whole deal. So if I sum those up again, 1% 1% better, or your spirit, uh, honor, truth, purpose-driven, and what one did I miss? I got them up on the wall. Honor, 1% joy field. Joy field, yeah. Yeah. So they're like literally, I don't know if everybody's Oh, got see. it. Okay. They're everywhere, and it's just kind of, but I will say this, it didn't come out of me saying, how should we go make a great culture? It just come out, come out of me going, why are we successful? How are we going to be? And it was looking at what mattered to me right then and there. These are the things, the ways of being that work for me and that are why I'm in business. They're what I would do in any situation. I didn't try to create them. I think you want to just go about your work and pay attention to what matters to you more than anything else because culture naturally will emerge. These things naturally come out. We just got to look at them and and discern them. Okay. So. In order to do that, you have to have, be a reflective person. So do you right. take time to reflect and to sort? I hired somebody to help me with it. Okay. So I had two mentors that they said, Jeremy, you need to have a process for how you make decisions when you're not in the room. And that's how these came to be. And they started with me. I bet it took us 12 hours. And I had, a, I, I wish I had say that the sheet that had words all over on it. And we just so sifted through them all until we came up with six one word descriptions. And, but they helped me do it. And if they wouldn't have been pushing me and helping me think and helping me reflect, cause you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. So I think it was essential to have somebody like yourself, somebody who knows these kind of things to be a sounding board and to give you a process to follow, to, to look at your life and, and discern what really matters to you. So here's, what's interesting uh, from what you say, when you've dealt with the, the, values, the belief system, your core beliefs in terms of how you operate, what drives you as a person. And you're going to respect that. That is going to automatically eliminate people you cannot work with. Yep. hundred percent. So part of what you've done is you've created a clarity for everybody. Yep. And that is often the biggest piece that's missing. Hmm. Yeah, I would, I could see that this is, these are the only things that have never changed in our business. I look at them every year. I reflect on them every year. They've never changed 10 years. No, I've had them for maybe seven. I don't remember, but they've never changed. So Jeremy, if a company is thinking about wanting to grow through collaboration, your advice to them, where do, how do they begin values? Then what? 
then having a, a proven process everyone can follow. And how do you create your process for you? Well, I think you got to look at the results. So that what we did is we got a bunch of results and then we looked at why the results were happening. And we tried to intentionally create a process out of that that could be duplicatable. If there's no process, there's nothing to duplicate. Absolutely. If there's, yeah, if there's no process, people are going to make their own. Um, where they where there's no rules, people just make up their own rules. Right. And so um, I wanted to show them that's part of, I think, the work of leadership. And my wife did this with me is, is creating that process that says you can trust it. So I say this to all of our people. People are going to trust you as a person, but they're going to pay for a process that is proven. So they'll trust you. They'll pay for a process. Without a process, you're just a really great person. You're a nice person. I like you, but I don't know what to pay you or how to pay you because I don't see a process I can pay for and follow. Right. I just said, yeah, good. Without a process, you, you don't have a measurable result. That's right. And there's nothing to duplicate. <laughs> Even if we said, you know, if I just preached our convictions, I'd be like a minister. I could do ministry or something and teach people how to think better, but it, the process makes the convictions actionable. Convictions are just convictions. I can have convictions. I can have beliefs, but my process is a container that allows me to put the convictions in action and make it represent something and make a result happen with them. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes an incredible amount of sense. And the beauty is it's simple, right? Yes. It's it's complex and it's simple. Boiling down pro- things to processes that are consistent and measurable is hard work. And then following it daily, that's hard work. Yeah. And the daily, that's where the 1% comes in, a daily process of refining it, making it better and better. That's where I do think, and, and I'm you're asking me great questions, Lois. I've never talked about this before because we this is all, you know, in the past two years, we've just been doing, I haven't been thinking about it. And so I really think if you don't have a proven process, you can't just make it. You have to have walked it. You got to put in the time. You got to put in the 10,000 hours. You got to do that. Otherwise, I'm not sure you, you have to build a different kind of community than what I'm talking about right now, because it is built off that. That was my big promise is if you do this, you will win. And then people started to do it and they started to win and they started to talk to each other like, hey, this thing is actually working and all those kind of things that I didn't want to control that I couldn't control and didn't care to control. It just started working for people. Isn't that that I think that's the beautiful part of collaboration done well it is. It, it generates an energy and an excitement because people are seeing a result that profit, money, yeah. they feel good, they feel successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and they were all winning and we were letting them win and we were celebrating them winning. And I think it's only going to be better now that we've seen it. Now we're going to, I'm going to put a, the right person to head up this part of the company um, we're going to build some process around that just to make their experience better with all their feedback and everything. And we'll just keep rolling. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Let me ask you one final question. Do you have a collaboration hero, somebody that you have seen do collaboration and you thought, wow, I'd like to be like that. I'd like to model myself after that. Hmm. That is a wonderful question. It really makes me think hard. I mean, golly, the biggest dude that I think just did outstanding, spectacularly wonderful and spectacularly horrible all in the same lifetime was King Solomon. He wrote the book of Proverbs. He wrote the book of wisdom, wisest man, richest man. And then he wrote Ecclesiastes, which is always lamenting, lamenting, all the mistakes he did. And he did spectacular failure, spectacular king. People came from all over the world at the time because of his wisdom and his discernment. And so I take a lot from that book. I could read it. I've read it so many times. I can keep reading it. It is the rich, the richest dude who ever lived wrote a book. The richest man I'll ever to walk the earth. Thank God wrote a book about here is, so think about this. 
a proverb is what a king would write to his heirs to say, this is how I rule. This is how the kingdom works. This is how it operates. This is how I make decisions. The richest man to ever live wrote, this is how I do things. I think it's pretty awesome. So I think that is a a fantastic book. People think the Bible is a book. It's a collection of books, 66 of them. So that's one book. I think is a, is a, I, you, you could not, if you just had that book, I think you'd be pretty good your whole life. Well, then he's also willing to be transparent enough to talk about his failures, right? Yeah. And he <laughs> is, wrote a whole book about his failures too. Yeah. Pretty bad. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to correct all of them, Yep. but he did share them. So the rest of us can learn from them. What have we met, left out? Jeremy, that people should think about or know as they think about collaborating? You know, I think you hit the nail on the head where you're like, it is, it's, it's simple and it's complex. I think that you got to have a team. You got to have a team of people. For me, the number one person on my team is always my wife, Brooke, um, invaluable for many, many ways in business, super valuable to the business. Um, and you got to have a team and, and like, that started the whole process off is I had seven people in a room for two days and a big old whiteboard and uh, editors, writers, designers, videographer, somebody who didn't even know anything about what we're even talking about. Cause I just wanted to see like, what would they come up with? So it was really collaborative from the very Genesis of the whole thing. But I think you got to have a team and a different disciplines, different levels of maybe buy-in different levels of incentive. It's got to be a pretty eclectic group. Okay, and I want to talk about that just for a moment. Yeah. Buy-in and incentive. What do you mean by that? Incentive meaning what, what do they have? Like buy-in, how bought in are they? Like, are they ownership? Are they an employee? Are they a vendor? Are you paying them for the scope? Is that it? What buy-in do they have? Different levels of that. People who are really committed, people who are like, I'm here to get paid and I'm going to give them all I got today, but they're talented people, but they don't have any, any incentive to see this thing win. So they're all going to think differently. They're all going to perceive the stuff differently, you know? And um, that's what I mean by buy-in and incentive, different levels of commitment, different levels of skill sets, because they're going to just see different things. Do you have a process that you use to select that team? Because that's those are huge, huge decisions you're making. Yeah, I didn't necessarily have a process I would follow, but if I reverse engineered our thinking, I wanted to have Brooke in there. I wanted to have a designer, a designer who could do architect design. Cause I was going to be saying, I said, I'm going to write a process out. I'd love you to make a visual. So I had her in the room. I had a writer who was capturing quotes and key lines I was saying. And I had a couple of people who were just thinkers in there because I was, I had a whole huge whiteboard. I'd fill it up. I'd erase it. I'd fill it up. I'd erase it. And I was just reverse engineering. Here's how we do everything from front to back. And then we did. And then my wife just pointed out a tiny little speck on the whiteboard and said, there's like our secret sauce. We have to build this out. And that became our whole process that everything got built on. So it was multiple disciplines, but also I knew who I knew the team I was going to need to execute and make it a thing. So I think it's like out of this little brainstorming collaborative session, what are the deliverables you're going to need? And that'll determine the talent you'll need in the room to create those deliverables. Right. And you found strength in diversity there. People from very different skill sets, bringing their knowledge. And I think sometimes we tend to choose people that are similar. And then we are left with holes. We're we're not complete in terms of what we need to create. Yep, totally agree. What else have we missed that we absolutely should leave with the audience? I think you've done a great job of asking the right questions to get people started. I don't think you can just say, I think you got to have something pretty amazing you got to have some results that are happening and you got to be like, I want to have this to happen to as many people as humanly possible. I think that creates like the, 
the seed and the intentionality to be like, I am going to, let's, let's do this. Let's put in the effort. Let's put in the work. Cause you're going to have to give a lot before you start to get, I think if you start to try to monetize it, maybe you're right out of the shoot. I don't know though. Shoot. We did. I don't know. I think, I think, and I think too, you got to just do it and you got to figure it out on the way. We had, we launched it at a whole different name right now. It's a certified Storyway guide that it was legacy guides in the beginning. I had to be willing to change and I had to sell people on that right away. I said, you're the first people to do this. It's the first time we've ever done it. You're going to get the first person price and you're going to get the first person problems because there's problems that we don't even know exist. And I just told everybody that. And so I said, be ready for change, but it's going to be awesome. So here you go. And they were willing to do it. You know, some people did go, oh, I just, I can't keep up with these people. It keeps changing on me. We had some of that. And then we had some people who just loved it. They saw it always getting better because it always did improve. So we never took a step back. Well, I admire that that tenacity of yours and your willingness to experiment because Creating something new is all about experimentation. You can't innovate any other way. Well, I think you got a message around that too of like, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to try something. I don't know if it's going to work. I think it will. We're going to try it for a certain period of time. And then I'll let you know if it works or not. We'll keep doing it. But otherwise, here's the, here we go. Here and then we you go. get everybody to buy and you get their permission. Jeremy, you have been wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate your wisdom and what uh, you've shared, especially about the values and looking at those basic constructs right from the beginning. So you know who people really are. I think that saves a lot of time. Yeah, thank you. Lois, this is an awesome conversation. I hope everybody's just subscribing to this. I hope they are writing reviews on your podcast and sharing it with their friends because this is a great conversation. So thank you so much for giving me the honor of being here with you. You are so welcome. And thank you, everybody, for being with us on Building My Legacy podcast, our collaboration series. And we will have information about Jeremy in the show notes so you can be in contact with him and enjoy his incredible publishing and ability to help you bring your book to market. So thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Lois. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like subscribe, and click the bell button above. Leave comments. We'd love to hear what you think. And visit our other social media links as well. Thanks much.